Um, so each of these staff members were outside on a uh, table, right? And they all had several questions on them. So they compiled a lot of your question and answers, anything that was redundant or anything like that, they put together. And we're going to do our best to answer your questions right now. And then if we cannot answer your question tonight, we just want to be transparent and say we don't know the answer. And it will be included in the frequently asked questions that we're going to be uploading on the website. So with that being said, I'm going to pass the mic over to Jake and let him uh, give his first question. Good evening. Thank you for hanging with us. Uh, and I think a few people came in new. So uh, great comments, great feedback. We got a lot of participation. And I appreciate that. Just so you know, if you don't hear your answer, uh, your question answered this evening, it's because we either need to reference more information or ask the private sector partners in the Leastima family or their consultants. But we're going to be putting out an FAQ page uh, for any questions that we don't answer this evening. So um, the first question I have is, what was the original acreage of property in the Hartshorn Park and Marina? How much property was lost to Adelaide Point and or Hartshorn Village? Um, so I think I want to make sure I make this clear and reference the presentation. So that area where Hartshorn Village is located was actually that former industrial employee parking lot. It was not a part of the park in Marina. It was a parking lot that the city acquired over time. I think it was utilized by Shaw Walker employees back in the day. Um, so there was no acreage that was dedicated to the park in Marina. The park in Marina is a charter park. It can't be conveyed to any private interest through a sale. So none of that acreage at the park or marina is lost. Uh, any use by a commercial entity is non-exclusive use, so it can't preclude any public members from using that usage. So I think that's probably what that question is asking. Um, so no acreage was given up. Uh, the original acreage of the property, I think it's 16 point something acres. I just looked today, but I looked at a lot of stuff today. <laughs> and so I'm not sure that's accurate. So that's my first question. Any uh, follow-ups on that one, anybody? Oh yeah, good point. Is that well answered? Yeah. Yes, Mr. Maholsky. What about the peninsula uh, uh, next, next to the small boat basin? The question was, what about the peninsula next to the small boat basin? Was it that city property? It, park? Yes, sir, it still is. And it will remain city property and publicly accessible and no longer gated. I think I referenced that in the presentation, but in case you missed it, it is not conveyed to any no, privacy. I'm talking about the western, the western side. Oh, the western side of that. Yeah, that's a good point. So there's been... Over the course of years, there's been separate surveys, and the previous owners of the private property uh, had their own survey that showed the entirety of that middle peninsula was private property. And then the city had a survey that showed that the eastern strip of it was city and the western portion was private. And there was, far before anybody here worked with the city, there was a uh, dispute over that. It was never resolved. Uh, it was just kind of left status quo. The small boat basin used it, uh, and then people were already kind of going out there, and the previous owner didn't preclude them from going out there. So there was never any action taken. Um, over the course of years, the high water has eroded both sides of that peninsula, where now it's probably approximately 40% of the width that it was. Uh, we had survey stakes in partnership with the Leeds was put out there in 21, just to kind of show, have a third party survey done, have it done again. And it showed that the survey demarcation for the line is actually in the water. Um, I can't speak to whether or not that's true today. Uh, because this was 2021 and the water levels have gone down some. But point being, that's been a long-standing dispute. The arrangement that we've made through the cooperative use agreement kind of makes it a moot point because now the entirety of both of those peninsulas will be publicly accessible. Thank you. Thank you. Pete, I'm going to go over to you for your first question. <laughs> oh. I'm going to tag team some of this. Uh, I got one brownfield related question and some others that I think my colleagues can address as well. But how much bond is the plan uh, is planning to be sold? City sells the bonds, repays over what period of time? Uh, 10.5 mil uh, million dollars. We're looking at uh, spring, um, spring, summer. spring, summer on that. And uh, over the course of years, <laughs> yeah. Can everybody hear me? I'm pretty loud. Just for the recording. Oh, sweet. Yeah, for the recording. That's good. Um, yeah. So. The other tricky thing here, and I referenced it in the presentation, but I didn't speak to it. It was in the narrative, uh, written narrative. Um, so if you combine the two brownfield plans, it's 15 to 18 years uh, for recapture of all public investment. So the Hartshorn Village site that was highlighted in blue, that's existing roadway and utilities that have already been installed. The city reimbursed the previous owner up front for those and became the party that could collect that TIF revenue. So that's one brownfield plan, which has its own repayment schedule. And then the larger bond issuance for this project uh, at Adelaide Point, where the new public 
facilities are contemplated for the spring would be $10.5 million, which would include roads, water, sewer, and that fishing pier and break wall, which would be a public asset moving forward. And that would be, if we get state capture, which I didn't want to get into any too far into the weeds on this, so we're asking the state of Michigan to be able to capture state taxes on that Brownfield as well. Uh, that's going before the state of Michigan strategic fund on February 28th. You can tune into that meeting. They do broadcast that. Um, you have to ask for it for some reason, but that's true. You can get to it. Um, and if that's granted, that will shorten the timeline considerably because it's an additional 18 mils worth of capture. So more tax money each year. Uh, if we don't get that, I think it's 18 years uh, for the TIF table to recapture. Uh, Hartshore Marina, will there be a gate that's locked during the nighttime hours? There, uh, in the large boat basin that's there now, I think I can just say, yeah, it, it closes at the end of business hours. I think it's between 5 and 6 o'clock. And then um, did Adelaide Point get or receive grants already from U.S. Fisheries, State of Michigan, or U.S. Department of Agriculture? Are they pending? There has been an appropriation from the Department of Natural Resources specific, uh, specifically for the fishing pier portion of the break wall at, to this point. Sure. Hold the mic. Um, one, so this question, I can't answer yay or nay, but I did want to address it because it's a citizen question that asked me to. Uh, with so much public outcry related to these projects, can we stop this project to collect more input from citizens? So I want to make this very clear. I referenced it uh, verbally and in writing. Um, there are portions of both the Hartshorn Village plan amendment and the Adelaide Point plan amendment that go before the city commission on February 14th. So two Tuesdays from now. Uh, I would encourage you that if you have concerns or questions at that, you engage with us prior and come to that meeting and give public comment. Um, obviously, as staff, we make a staff recommendation, but the commission, some of whom are here tonight, they have to yay or nay these changes. Um, also on that agenda would be the addendum to the Brownfield Agreement, which would be sort of the no-go no agreement that says, okay, Adelaide Point is building these assets and in exchange the city is going to build this public infrastructure. So that is a very impactful meeting. If you care about the outcome of this project, I would highly recommend you either send written communication to the clerk's office or attend if possible. But as to whether or not we can stop it, it's, you know, it's going before the city commission as they're the policy deciders in that case. In addition, all of your comments, ooh, that was very loud. Um, all of your comments today that you guys put up on your boards and the questions that you put today will all be compiled and um, on our staff review meeting on Monday from this event. Uh, we'll be looking at those and they'll work on it together as well. So they'll be seen that way. Um, I have a question over here. Jake, I think you're going to be answering it as well. Okay. I'm sorry. That's um, all right. <laughs> uh, this is a frequent one here. If the project moves forward and we do have issues with bikers or walkers or boaters using the bike trail, what are some actions that could be taken to make sure that people can continue to have access to that space? Sure. So right now, the cooperative use agreement that exists has specific provisions and it's out there on the table. And if you need a copy, send us an email and we'll send you a copy. We just didn't want to kill a bunch of trees and print a bunch of copies. But um, there's specific areas of that agreement that protect the public interest in that marina. First and foremost, the access there is non-exclusive, meaning it cannot preclude, preclude the public from using it. If we get complaints that it can't be used effectively by the public or the inverse, if the developer says, or the, uh, the owner and operator says, you know, I can't do what I intended to do here. There's mediation provisions in that agreement that say we have to work that out between each other legally through the commission and their purview and the, the representative of the private sector. So there's one aspect to that. The other aspect to that uh, is the fact that we have what we call a conditional agreement in that. So in the event that we pre prevent or uh, impede the ability for the boat rack storage operation to take place in that marina, then those e conditional easements can be removed if there's a material breach of that contract and vice versa. So if we feel as though the spirit of that agreement is not being reached, then we can say, okay, there's been a breach here and we either need to fix it or we, we are going to take back oper uh, non-exclusive use of that for commercial purposes and then in exchange for that we would lose the right to use those private peninsulas. So those are the, tri uh, the trigger mechanisms in that agreement. That's probably an oversimplification. It's a legal document. Yeah, question in the back. Yeah, in regards to that, does that mean Adelaide Point can turn around three years from now and say your bike trail impedes our business, so yeah. that's a breach of that agreement? And mm. force us to your railroad easement that you're trying to get in front? No. The, Go ahead uh, and repeat that question, Jake, oh, just so we can have okay. it recorded. Right oh, cool. <laughs> <laughs> Is it both of these? Um, it's... 
Yeah, it's a stop one. Okay. Yeah. So what guarantees that the entire bike path remains open and will not be forced to the railroad easement or otherwise impacted by that agreement? So that bike trail is a fee simple piece of property. What's granted in that uh, agreement is use non-exclusive use of the marina facility itself. So just because there's bikers going over that fee simple piece of property does not uh, impact that agreement or the terms of that agreement. That is a separate public asset. And again, I would encourage, the document is out there, but again, if anybody needs a copy, I have 50 more cards out there. Shoot me an email and we'll get that over to you. Yeah, one more question. Um, Two. With uh, the fishing piers or question was if the peninsulas that are uh, out there on Adelaide Point, if they could be taken away and be made private. If, yeah. if, they disagree if we disagree with the agreement. If yeah. there is a dissolution of that contract, so if there's a breach that neither side is willing to correct based on the terms, then that would be, the uh, operator of the boat storage facility would no longer be able to use the boat marina, the facilities at the marina, and we would no longer have guaranteed public access to those two peninsulas. Yeah. So as of now, the city is not bonding for those park improvements. Those are improvements that are made by the owner. But that is something that is being contemplated uh, in the final draft of this agreement going forward on the 14th. So again, that could change. Something to add? If we do the, if we do the park improvements, then it will yeah, but, cannot be revoked. Oh, and that's a good point. So uh, the deputy city manager uh, made a good follow-up point. In the event that the city does install those park agreements, those easements would be amended to be irrevocable, and then they could not be taken away regardless of what goes on at the marina. But that's only in the event that we pay for those public installations. Thanks, Leanne. We have one more question over here. I don't understand why we, we would lose both in this agreement. Have we given both one that we don't currently own the two that we don't the two, yeah the two the two that we don't currently own so the one Jonathan, on can you repeat the question sure uh, why would we lose both um, peninsulas we're not talking about the one immediately to the east side of the small boat basin we're talking about stuff further to the west um, but the way that the uh, bonding agreement the amendment that'll be up before the commission on the 14th is worded is if public dollars are used for any part of uh, an improvement that will be a permanent irrevocable easement um, at that point in time so when if public dollars are used in that ten and a half million bond which would be paid repaid through TIF like we just talked about those would be permanent public easements a lot of peas in there um, <laughs> permanently public yeah per <laughs> I think Jake's pulling something up for us. Oh, I just want to put an overview of like some existing, that's not the current site plan, that's kind of <laughs> jumbled. Just try to find a, one of these maps that kind of shows an overview. I think well, while he's doing that, uh, I'm Dan Vanderheide. I'm the public works director for the city. I've got a question here that says, uh, what, the first portion we already addressed, but I, I believe the second portion and I think I'd like to address. So this, this, did the city sell the Hartshorn Marina and that was developed with a DNR grant to Mr. Leitzma and his and and uh, his or her company if so how is that legal so as we've said before no the marina is not sold it's still owned by the city and it's in fact a charter park park so it could never be sold without a vote of the people the confusion may be that least my management uh, operates the marina on behalf of the city that's because the owner of the Hartshorn village property has uh, the right to maintain, or excuse me, to manage the marina on behalf of the city if the city chooses to have the marina managed. So we as the city could take that management back at any time, uh, but it is convenient for us to have it managed. And under the agreement for that Hartshorn Village uh, development, the owner of that property has the right then to manage that. So that's why you see their logos on things out there. Um, but again, it's, it's uh, managed on behalf of the city. Dan, we have a question in the back here. Sure. How much will they get paid to manage that? 
Uh, there's, uh, I, I don't know that number off the top of my head, but there's uh, management fees that are paid to them uh, annually. Uh, one of the uh, folks here has asked for some detail on that budget, so I'll be pulling that together, and, and I think you've got my contact information, so if you'd like to see that, you're welcome to. I think we had one more question in the front. Sure, we'll get it in the FAQs as well. My question, it has to do with the launch itself. It's, to me, when I look at it on the map, it looks like a vortex of real stress because We've got triple, tra triple axle trailers bringing in anything between a 30 and a 60 foot boat on our launch right now, our present launch, right? Am I right on that? Uh, there'll be improvements made to that launch, I believe. But I'm just asking where they're going in. Right there. Yeah, that okay. Yeah. And then, so my understanding is the place that we're going to be taking this 48,000 pound forklift is or 84,000 pounds is going to be on the, um, the east side towards the boys club am i right about that that gap where the the metal is it's a, it's, it's right so, next right next to the so, boat launch so it's going to be in there and somewhere in the middle of there i've seen that this is the space where we're going to allow the handicapped fishermen to have all the fun they want with a 25,000 pound boat with a 84,000 pound machine behind them that will blacken out the light. The question I have is, how are people going to get their cars, or are we even going to allow anyone to put our own little fishing boat in there? How are they going to negotiate that pathway? Because it sounds like I've been out there, I've got all kinds of videos, and I'm, I want to present that. I, I was hoping to present that. I, to me, it looks like it's going to be fraught with danger, lots of risk, and could you answer the question, are they going to have to negotiate these boats going in and out, the regular people with their little, you know, 12 foot fishing boat? So I think I heard two questions in there. One was, how are we going to have handicap accessibility for fishermen along the area? And then also the accessibility for smaller boats to use that launch. Well, is that? It's sort of the question, is it between? It, it is between the two launch areas that the handicap fishing? No. No. Okay. No. The, 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 hand, the handicap uh, and, and other parking for the use of, for example, the, the peninsula that's currently part of the small boat basin will be to the north and west of the launch areas. And you would access those from the Adelaide Point public roadways. So you're come saying these point. peninsula <laughs> you drive back Yes, <laughs> come on over Jake, here. can you point that out on there? <laughs> <laughs> All right, let's you're see. You're saying that they're going to drive to the end of the point okay. before they there fish out there right now. All right. Not, not Sir, to the end, but. Can you see the cursor up here on the, the television right there? I'm moving yes. it around not super wieldy on a laptop. So historically, as we referenced, this is where the forklift drops are, and this is the area of reinforced 10 inch concrete. So as of now, folks park all the way along this section here, including in front of these existing trailer spots on this hardscape because it's easy for them to pull up, park, throw a chair down and, and fish. So the only area where the forklift drops are, are right here to the left of this right. bumper. So this is trailer parking. People do use it with their cars as of now. There would be expanded car parking built over here for passenger cars. Yeah. And then there'd be trailer parking here as well for folks that are using the launch. So as to your question about whether or not handicapped people or people with uh, other abilities would be expected to par like fish between the boat launch and the forklift drop, the answer is no. So the forklift drop area is right in this general area. There's more hardscape right here, which I don't believe anybody would preclude them from fishing on, but what we contemplate in the Hartshorn, uh, potential public improvements to Hartshorn is turning this into an ADA accessible fishing area. As of now, people fish there, but they're mostly people that can traverse the terrain, which has been damaged by high water. And so over the course of time, we would like to put in a hardscape along that. And that's where I reference, we're gonna be doing our Parks and Rec master planning before we go just randomly asking for money from the commission in this next budget cycle. We'd like to get citizen feedback on what we wanna do over here. But point being, this is where, that was what I was highlighting in red, was this is where people with uh, limited mobility tend to fish now. We don't wanna prevent them from being able to fish if we're going to allow fishing continually 
as an intended concern at this park, I think it needs to move here and other places along this, this wall. So that, that's, I think, an answer to your question. No, we're not expecting that's them to one operate. Question. The other one has to do with trying to negotiate that launch with these big boats. Sure. I think that's where you're on that one. Yeah, it's, um, it, it's going to be designed to accommodate boats of all different sizes. And, and you know, boat, boat launches are typically operated in a wait-your-turn fashion. So if, if you come in with your smaller boat, you'll wait, you know, in a line or in a staging area until it's free, and you'll have use of the ramp to back your boat in. But there wouldn't be specific preference. Oh, thank you. There wouldn't be specific preference to any one boat. It's non-exclusive access. So if... I get in there with my 14-foot bass boat first, that I'm going. But if I don't, then I'm waiting. Are we doing more follow-ups or are we going to? I, I don't mind. I just like, if yeah. there's any pressing issues, we can take them. But Mr. Thompson there. Go ahead. Uh, this is just a little add-on to his question. The in-and-out service, the boat, the forklift line. Sure. Mm -hmm. When they launch those boats, they don't drive them anywhere. They dock them. Where are they going to be putting those docks till the owners sure. or those boats until the owners pick them up? <laughs> Yeah, that's a good question. So I'm going to go back over here again <laughs> just because it's easier to reference the map. So as was mentioned, part of this peninsula, uh, peninsula park would be shopper docks and transient docks on either side of this. So this would be a staging area for people at the beginning of their boating day. So if you're somebody who's coming from out of the area, you call and say, hey, I want my boat in the water, please. Like they're going to take it out on the forklift. Marina and uh, management staff would bring it over here. And then folks would park either in this parking lot, this new parking lot. There's also a parking lot in this area right here. And then there's a large parking lot contemplated on the PUD right there. Park in one of those parking lots and then go to their boat. Most likely, they're probably going to want to park in these two lots right here. I've never seen an in and out service run the boats. That's quite a liability for Marina. They're not going to just tie them up right by the lunch there? Not to my knowledge, based on the PUD plans that have been submitted. No. Okay. Awesome. All right. This is a question maybe for Jonathan. We'll see. Um, do we plan on working with the Muskegon County Sheriff to control noise enforced by the new additional boats? Uh, well, that, that is the purview of the Sheriff's Department. Um, so any complaints that would come in would need to be um, dialed into 911, and then the Sheriff's Department would respond to that um, because there's you know, access to Muskegon Lake off of Lake Michigan or various other marinas. Um, I, I don't know that we could say for sure if where boats were coming or where the noise from those specific boats were coming from, but if there are noise issues, um, the Sheriff's Department would be the one to um, enforce that. So. Okay, thank you. Yeah. I, I have a statement and a question. Okay. Um, statement is, I've, I've been a, a boater in the Snowball Basin for 30 years, and there's no possible way you could put a 50-foot boat in that channel, turn it around and come out, and if you got more than one boat, there's that room for them to even pass each other. And the other question is, you're showing a launch ramp on, on the property, Grand Line Point, why isn't he using that launch ramp to launch his boat? Why does he have to come over and use city property? That's convenient. That's on one of my pieces of paper. So I'll address that one first. Um, so yeah, why can't Adelaide Point continue to use their current launch? So the site plan, which that's not the site plan, that's the existing condition. Um, the site plan currently contemplates several buildings and structures and parking, a public parking lot and other amenities that are currently right where the pathway of that launch is. Again, the launch would, uh, there's only a launch over there. There's no vertical drop, so there would be no fork operation. It would only be trailer, park, uh, trailer launch. And so that's not contemplated in what the owner of the property desires to do with that property from a mixed-use standpoint. Um, and I don't think we could require them from a planning standpoint to say, you have to use this existing site. Um, I think we would uh, probably run afoul of the planning enabling act there but I don't know that but that's my guess so that's the answer that uh, I can provide is that the site plan calls for additional buildings that would be directly in the way of that existing launch and then your first question was really it was a statement it was related to 
boats. And, uh, so what I'll do, I'm going to make a note of that, Mr. Mahalski, and we're going to, if any of them that we can't answer tonight because we want to talk to the consultants or the Brownfield consultants or the owner, we'll have them compose answers and we'll put that on the FAQ sheet as to how they intend to accomplish those things. Thank you for the question, though. Thank you. Awesome. This might be a question for Pete or maybe Jake. Maybe um, Pete. Maybe Pete. Maybe <laughs> Pete, if anybody wants to pass a microphone down that way. Um, how does Brownfield TIF work compared to TIFs used by the city historically? Oh, go ahead. <laughs> you could handle that. All right. Okay. All right. I see how it is. Um, that's a great question. So it works very similarly. So uh, there's lots of different types of tax increment financing districts in Michigan. So there's downtown development authorities. That's the one people are most uh, familiar with. I think we had at least one or two members of our Muskegon DDA here tonight. Um, there's corridor improvement authorities, uh, which I see a member of one of those sitting over there right now. Uh, so those are all TIF districts. So basically the rule of thumb is the same. So whenever a TIF district plan is created, whatever you're paying in taxes right there, whatever, say your taxable value is $100,000 on this piece of property, that's where the starting point is. And so they say tax increment financing. The increment is the difference over time between that $100,000 base value and any future value created. So brownfield is often advantageous for TIF naturally because it's often either dilapidated buildings or vacant space and there's going to be usually immediate construction or soon to be immediate construction which creates a lot of value quickly. DDAs work a little bit differently because there's usually already buildings there and they just sort of organically increase in value over time like all of our taxes do over time. Um, an average in Michigan over the last several years has been, well over the last 20 years has been like 2.2% but now it's been higher the last several years. But So if it goes up 2% from that $100,000 year over year, that TIF district just generated $2,000 that they can do whatever the law that their tax increment financing district was created in allows them to do. So with brownfields, they're specifically restricted to reimbursement of eligible activities, whereas DDAs can do fun stuff like facade grants or actually own buildings and lease out buildings, uh, give liquor licenses, things like that. Um, brownfield is much more restricted in that it's meant to remediate either functionally obsolete, blighted, vacant, or environmentally damaged properties. So that's how the TIF works. Uh, that's how it relates to other TIFs. It does basically the same thing, but it's got a much narrower scope of, of ability. That was a long answer. I'm Just sorry. a really great opportunity through Eagle grant or loan opportunities uh, as an incentive for uh, developers to take on that risk and, and redevelop a site that's, um, that, that can be put back to productive use. And so it's a, it's a good tool the state provides, and uh, at least to provide that option for a developer to um, get that property moving. Thank you. Yep. Question? Yeah. Uh, you said the two points that were in question would become your, your locally public access if the city contributed to it. So in the event that in the development agreement, the city has not contemplated bonding over the amount that was stated, which is $10.5 million. So that's the uh, engineered estimates for the roads, water, sewer, break wall. But say that the concrete bids come back or the construction bids come back less, it may be advantageous for the city to still bond that total amount so that we can have irrevocable public access there in exchange for building that park property. You have to contribute the entire amount or you would have to just We would contribute the entire amount to build the parks, but then they would become irrevocable because they had public assets okay. on them. It's not just a contribution mm -mm. to it. You have to do the entire Yes, sir. At least that's my understanding as up to now. Great. Thank you. Dan, do you have anything over there that is still pressing? You have a lot of them. Yeah. I, I do still have a few to go. So a um, couple of them are quick. Where will the sailboats dock or anchor in Muskegon Lake as they have in the past? Uh, the same place. Um, that portion of the marina is uh, not necessarily contemplated for any, any change at this time. Um, in fact, we're making repairs to the uh, mooring field right now in order to address some issues that have come up uh, due to the high water. So they will still be there. That's what I got. <clears throat> uh, question about bait disposal. Uh, that's not something that I'm aware has been contemplated yet. Uh, yeah, I'm not sure if that just means like, like a, a fish cleaning? A fish or cleaning station, I would assume. Yeah, because I, mean, I always just throw my bait in the garbage when it is yeah. done. Well, like, uh, yeah, so I think we, we, one of the things that, and I really want to hit this home again, please do participate in that uh, Parks and Rec master planning process because this is, in my opinion, uh, a park that could be utilized a lot more for general public benefit. And one of the assets that it's missing is fish cleaning amenities. I see people, I walk that trail all the time with my dogs and my kids, just like all of you. And I see people with a bucket of fish like that are probably relying on it and they're leaving 
to go take it. Oh, there's no reason they have to do that. Most of the other marinas and, and you know, fishing oriented parks have fish cleaning stations. Uh, we'd like to consider that. But as of now, I guess people throw their bait away in the public garbage cans that are there. Please consider not doing that. <laughs> <laughs> will, will there be a sign uh, for the Hartshorn Park and Marina? Um, I am under the impression there is a sign there. The one on Western Avenue was removed as part of some earlier work, but the sign as you enter the marina is still there. Um, and I think it also bears mentioning, and someone brought it up during the uh, interaction time. So part of the stuff that I couldn't get in there uh, in the 40 minutes that I spoke. So the Hartshorn Village Condominium Agreement, which is out there again, and I'm happy to provide a copy to anybody who would like one, um, contemplates uh, what happened when that driveway went away, right? So you can't just take the driveway away and have no access to the marina. So an easement uh, through what is currently the Fricano's driveway and parking lot was is recorded when that first parcel of property was sold. And then once the third phase commences, that, and in this case, when Adelaide Boulevard would be built between phase three of Hartshorn Village and the Adelaide Point property, that would be the public road that would be permanently dedicated to the city. And that easement on that property would go away. So basically the whole access to the marina moves, it would be to the west, I guess, um, over the course of time. So that question was posed earlier, but it is related to that. And as to the sign, I think the intention was to put up a temporary sign at that site uh, in partnership with Mr. Fricano, working with him, and I don't think that ever happens. So that's something we need to follow up on. Yeah, follow-up question? Yes. To the point that you keep talking So, So my, my response to that would be that the, the, the agreements that are currently in place and the way that the, the trail was um, purchased uh, 20 years ago-ish um, and the way all these things are going to work together, uh, we're going to make sure that we maintain that. Um, and I can only give you, you know, guarantees on what, what it'll be like with the current staff that's here in the commission. We're aware of we're aware of how all these different agreements work together and we want to make sure that we're maintaining this access and these resources that are the cities in perpetuity into the future as long as we're here as a team i can't you know 40 years from now i, I you know i probably won't be here um so i can't say for sure how that will work but what the team that's here we know what the agreements are in place and we'll go through you know processes that we have to go through and but it's never our intent to get rid of these things and I appreciate where you're coming from and I know that that frustration it's not um, it's not something that that we want to go through again and the, the that circumstance is a little bit different um, but this you know we, we understand these agreements that are here in place and we want to make sure that this um, public access is there. It's good for the development. It's good for the community to make sure that there's public access through that trail, through that fishing pier, and through those um, other amenities. Dude, this whole thing happened mm -hmm. three years ago. It's fine mm -hmm. to say that that was the previous administration, mm -hmm. but we're all a little sour about it because mm -hmm. we just found out about it. Mm -hmm. And so these sort of things, it, you have to excuse us a little oh, yeah. bit when you say it's going to be permanent. We all go, Hurrah! because that's how we feel is that this is not old news. This is not 40 years ago. This is 
three years ago that the previous mayor gave away and signed away these things that we believed to be public property, and we've watched it disappear. And so excuse us for being a little bit sour, because we're all, I think everybody who cares about it, is a little bit sour about the way this is all going, and about how the public property that's supposed to be permanently ours seems to continue to disappear and become private, and we don't like it. We don't like it, and this current thing is not working. It's not working. Thank you. I think we had one more question back here. It's a comment slash question. Um, so I wanted to, first of all, appreciate that we have this forum and the opportunity to engage. This is something that we're continuing to try to develop as a community and interested parties from many different walks of life. But I'm inquiring if the city staff has come to a consensus that there's a clear interest in further developing the lakeshore as a public space and is strongly considering using public dollars to do that regardless of whether this proposal moves forward. I think that there will be some development in this parcel because it clearly is not um, you know, privately owned. But are you clearly aware and understand that there is avid interest in developing for public use and potentially using public dollars? Yes, we know that there is there is interest in that, and uh, zoning ordinances have been updated fairly recently about, was it 50? Or what was the percentage? Oh, the percentage. Of yeah. So, yeah, that's for, oh, sure, oh, sorry. Yeah, I think the question pertains to, like, in the even private public partnership developments aside, you're saying that you want to know that the city staff is dedicated in making a priority improvements to public access on Muskegon Lake. Is that the question? This specific site. Okay, this specific, heart short, yes. Sure. Space, they want to see trail access. These are things that the community seems to want to prioritize, regardless of the private development that is adjacent to it. And is that being prioritized in your budget? Okay. So, okay, yeah, and I, I appreciate that question. So I'm going to sound like a broken record, but please do participate in our parks and rec planning. We want as much citizen engagement as we can get um, because there's a ton of projects that could take place at Hartshorn, at Cottage Grove. There's a lot of worthy projects at these public access sites, not just for boating and fishing, but picnicking and other passive recreation opportunities. And yeah, I think we have a staff, and I certainly, I don't want to speak for the commission, but I believe a commission that is devoted to improving parks and recreation opportunities, and that absolutely includes this site and others on Muskegon Lake. Um, I'm a resident. I use those parks. I use the trail. Um, I've seen some of you there. I, you know, for years as a homeowner before my time with the city, I was hoping for some assets that could be used at those parks. So at least from a development services standpoint, a staffing standpoint, we are certainly going to advocate for investments there that would come out of the public works budget. So I, I'm not going to write them into my budget because I can't. But um, at those budget conversations, I think there's pretty much consensus that we could do better at some of these sites. And I, to reference that presentation again, I think the high water probably just hurried along a conversation that needed to be had several years prior. So, yes, in a short answer. Did I say anything you don't concur no, no, no. <laughs> And to, to build on that, when we do talk to other folks who are looking to do developments, public access is part of that conversation, whether it's in this spot or other parts um, of the community. So that is always a, a conversation point that comes up. Lovely, thank you. I have one more question in the back and then we're gonna wrap up and go ahead. land and public access will remain public access regardless of the administration, regardless of any commission that the city has, regardless of anything the mayor wants to do, and make it so hard or so crystal clear that no one could ever go in there and try and make that private property. I believe that the way that we're structuring those agreements does that. Well, I want to I want to ask a clarifying question. So when you're looking at those three peninsulas, when we talk about, and earlier you referenced a question about like if we made parks improvements there, they would become irrevocable. I just want to make sure it's well understood. The, those peninsulas are private property now, and so we're trying to ascertain public access to them, but they're not the cities at this point. I, I realize that. Okay. What we came through with that question was how much would you have to contribute to ensure public access? Oh, I see. Would it, would it, would Adelaide Point, as a matter of public interest, say, you contribute $10 per point, and we will guarantee that you, you're, become irrevocably public property or access? 
I see. Yeah, so at this point, um, we haven't had those specific conversations because the structure of that arrangement is so that these non-exclusive uses of the boat launch and forklift drops uh, and other aspects of Hartshorn Marina are what that private owner gains. And that's similar to what Lumbertown did. They leased the property. They didn't give anything up for it. I think they just paid a nom nominal amount for it. But um, So this would be effectively like us using these in exchange for that access. So here's a challenge with that. As was mentioned before, this is a charter park. We can't convey it to anybody, and we don't want to, and we couldn't without a vote of the people anyway. So in the event that we tried to convey that in exchange for that, we can't do it. Um, and then I don't think that it would really be an equitable position unless we, as I mentioned, paid for the public improvements to it. So if we pay for the public improvements to it, to your earlier question, then we will put language in there saying this is ours, like, you know, or at least our access is ours, um, whether it remains private or not, similar to a sidewalk in front of your house. Like it's, you know, on private property technically, but it's an access easement that can't be taken away by that owner. So, but that, uh, so that is in the realm of possibility, I guess is what I'm trying to say. But as, it, as the deal is structured today, we've never contemplated that without having to give that access to the marina. All right, we are, oh. This uh, peninsula, um, the, I guess it would be this one, um, it shows, you said if um, the city did not put any park on it, any improvements, um, that it would revert, or they would be able to just close it off. The one that looks like it's half um, Adelaide Point and half Kirkshore Park. Yep, so that is a map that reflects the, I think I referenced this in an earlier question. So, yeah, so, yeah, well, no, and even before that, there was a disputed uh, claim of ownership or claim of, uh, yeah, it would be ownership. So, um, well, and so we did investigate that, um, not in an adversarial manner with the current owner, because this was a dispute between the city and a previous owner years ago, um, and we found that in our research, kind of contemplating these projects. So, uh, and then some citizens gave us good historical context as well, including the Muskegon Lake Watershed Partnership. And so we had a survey done, uh, and the survey stakes at that time showed that a lot of that land is currently underwater. Now, I believe at one point... Um, if it should uh, reappear... Then there's that survey area. Yeah, certainly, certainly. But um, And then the other thing to co uh, contemplate would be, uh, I believe that the Adelaide Point uh, group, the Leastimas, asked Eagle for permission to restore that, to put that land back, to widen that peninsula. And I don't, I don't want to say this to a certainty, but I believe that Eagle denied them that opportunity. You're nodding as though you might know. But <laughs> That's my understanding as well. Okay. Yeah. So they applied for an opportunity, a permit through Eagle to put that back. Um, and I don't know all the details, but I believe it was soft shore and widening the, the area. And Eagle told them no. I don't know precisely why, but I can investigate that and put it in the fact sheet, the frequently asked question sheet that we're going to publish. Thank you, Jake. All right, you guys, we are getting close to 10 minutes over our time here, so I'm going to wrap us up, but I wanted to say how thankful I am for all of you for attending today's session. Um, there is a survey on our website. You can, again, scan the QR code or visit that, and it's going to allow you to give feedback on today's public meeting, and it's also going to allow you to ask any outstanding questions. You can see on lineup here that our recordings of the FAQ session and from Jake's presentation are going to be back on the website next week, and again, it is this same link everything will be in the same spot um, and then Jake and Jonathan mentioned a few different engagement opportunities that are coming up and you'll be able to find those on our website and also if you signed up for the e-newsletter list there's an option to do that on the site here or there's a physical copy outside in the hall um, I'll pass it to Jonathan or Jake if you want to say anything else we honestly really appreciate you guys all coming out this was a new format for us um, Deborah was the one who really helped kind of uh, design this process. Um, we'll probably refine it a little bit, maybe look for a bigger space next time, but thank you for coming out and asking questions and engaging with us. This is something that we're committed to doing um, in the future and, and we hope to get just as good a turnout. So thank you and thank you for your questions, honestly. We appreciate it. Thank you, everybody. Thank you, guys.